legalization of human rights and the military Frankly, when you, when you regularize the situation, uh, it can be so sensitive and you see more atrocities happening in this country in question than in other countries. Other, uh, other regimes see, okay, these people are being abuses and yet they're being accepted at international cocktail parties. Uh, so, uh, so it's not so bad when you do these kind of things. That's, that's not the impression that we want to have exist out there. So uh, and as Canadian proletarians around the world, uh, we need to say no to that regularization and push for meaningful accountability and reconciliation. One of the things I spoke about today, for example, was how during a peacekeeping uh, conference here in Canada, in Vancouver, uh, there was an immunity order put forward by the government that allowed people to participate in that conference who might uh, otherwise have have been liable for prosecution when they were here in Canada. So uh, it, it's very important that, that we challenge the government from, a, from an opposition perspective. I'm an opposition MP that we challenge the government. Why was that immunity order put in place? Who was it that was being protected by this immunity order? Uh, given the record of Sri Lankan military, uh, big concerns about their participation in a peacekeeping conference. It's not only what's happened in Sri Lanka, but it's also uh, what happened in Haiti, of course. Uh, uh, terrible, terrible crimes committed against the Haitian people, uh, for which, again, there hasn't been, been meaningful accountability. So these are, these are ongoing issues, especially around international peacekeeping, when you're supposed to be a force that's going out uh, to be promoting peace, uh, and, and you have a military with the kind of record that you see in this case. Very, very concerning, and we need to, to be aware of and speak out against that. Um, another note that uh, we observed during the conference was uh, monument, monument, monumentizing a uh, symbol, symbol for relief against the Tamil lives that were lost um, for the cause by the Sinhalese government through the genocide, through the several atrocity things that we heard here. Um, so monuments today are being uh, destroyed and it's, it's kind of a healing process for the community to go reflect, repent. Uh, at those monuments. Um, and there's a lot of Tamil diaspora around the world. Um, uh, as, as, as an opposition party MP, uh, do you think it would, there would be any possibilities for the Tamil diaspora to engage and build a monument uh, in Canada for the diaspora, not just for Tamil Canadians, but also for Tamils that are surviving members around the world? Hmm. Well, certainly I think it's important to remember uh, crimes that have, have happened against uh, against different communities. Uh, there's obviously precedent for that here in Canada. We have a, a Holocaust memorial. We have the construction of a memorial to the victims of communism, which is uh, which is another important important cause. So there's certainly precedent for for communities to take a step to, to construct different kinds of, of memorials uh, in, in these cases. And I mean, there have to be discussion about the particulars of how that would unfold and uh, and the message that would be sent by that in, in, in individual case but certainly um, remembering the victims and making sure that there isn't uh, impunity that we reflect on violence that has happened in the past as a way of promoting reconciliation ensuring it doesn't happen in the future uh, very much uh, wor worth consideration and discussion absolutely and another thing that we also understand is the uh, the flow of administering the funds uh, to the to the Sri Lankan government for rehabilitation as such. And Canada is a great supporter for international aid, uh, helping several nations around. Um, and definitely, you know, there's one 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 way to say. Uh, boycott and stop all instances, but also to make sure the uh, you know the funds need to reach out to those that are needy. Um, they should not uh, not receive the funds just because uh, they're Sri Lankan per se. But if there's a real need for somebody Sri Lankan uh, of whatever ethnicity uh, that lives in the country that needs the aid, uh, we're helping. But. Uh, how can we further en enhance our policies uh, to, s to, to make sure that these funds are reaching uh, to those people and not uh, the governments administering it and just sending out a report and simply accepting it for us to be the okay. Um, uh, so do you have any thoughts on that? Sure, well I've heard concerns from the community about aid projects being concentrated in the south and not uh, reaching people in the north. So these are things that we need to uh, to, to be challenging and asking the questions about, about how that's being distributed. Look, I think Canada needs to be engaged with Sri Lanka. We need to be pushing human rights in a tough way uh, and we need to be trying to build 
capacity in a way that leads to reconciliation. Uh, so, so it's not about uh, total disengagement or uh, uh, engagement, whatever happens, and, and let's all hold hands and sing. It's, it's really kind of encapsulating both aspects of, of uh, in investing in, in aid and reconciliation, but being tough, confronting leaders, and using tools like boycotts of high-level meetings uh, as a way of, of sending a clear message about just certain things that are happening that are uh, that are unacceptable. You know, I think when it comes to Canadian aid, uh, we need to look for that sweet spot of promoting pluralism, promoting intercommunity engagement and dialogue, uh, pr promoting uh, pro-pluralism education. Uh, and, and I think there, there's always more we can do with that. And there was a vehicle we used to have called the Office for Religious Freedom uh, that had, had, it had a program in Sri Lanka, it had a program in Pakistan specifically around education, working with the Aga Khan Foundation on developing curricular materials that encourage pluralism and peaceful coexistence. So I always ask the question as Canada, you know, is, is it enough to just be funding someone else who's doing it, or do we need to be more engaged directly in terms of the development of curriculum, looking at details, promoting a kind of education that really reflects universal human values? So, uh, important discussions and worth diving deeper in terms of how we engage uh, to make sure we're as effective as we can be. Um, thank you for your time again. Thanks for all those uh, um, uh, thoughts uh, and advice to the Tamil diaspora. Again, I would like to thank you on behalf of EETV uh, for your time today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks so much for, for the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you.